As we're talking about sacred, and we're in a study on the book of First Thessalonians, and today we're dealing with what is called a sacred privilege. Today we move forward in this study on sacred, taken from the book of First Thessalonians, and today we're moving into chapter 3. And as we open our Bibles today uh, to this portion of Scripture, we're going to look at the sacred privilege today of suffering. Well, you say, preacher, that's not a very good subject. Well, it's something that we all face and deal with every day in some capacity. So it's good that we know where to take and how to get relief from our suffering. So there's a lot of things in life that we consider to be a privilege, but I'm sure none of you would consider suffering to be one of them. But we're going to maybe change your perspective of that. And I'm talking about, you know, the things we go through. It's inescapable. It's unavoidable. It comes with life. And, and whether it's issues in your life, whether it's uh, difficulties with your health or your family or your finances or your friends or any number of things that you face, you know, we often ask the question, how can such horrible things happen to such good people? And, uh, and of course, I bet there's probably been a gazillion messages preached on that topic alone a lot of bad things happen to good people and uh, and then we grab Romans 8 28 and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them that are called according to his purpose and all those things are applicable but these questions still arise in our life every day why does God allow these things to occur I'm sure every one of us in this room someplace some point sometime in life has looked towards heaven and said why why am I going through this? Why am I facing that? And of course, we often will take and focus our attention on other people. And we say, well, look at the way they're living and look what they're doing. And why aren't they suffering? Well, let's see if we can defuse some of these things today for you. We realize there's times that marriages fail. There's times that a surgery is not successful. We realize that there's a time that our dreams, rather than becoming reality, they become shattered. So maybe it's a goal that resulted in a failure, or maybe it was a promise that was shattered or broken in life. All these things. I would love to stand up and tell you, now that you're a Christian, everything's going to be wonderful and good forever. Well, not while you're on this earth, is not. But it will after that. When we're, when we're in the presence of the Lord, in this stage of preparation, things are going to be awesomely good there and never another struggle. Maybe sometimes, you know, people deal with an addiction that won't leave them alone. It just seems like it just hangs on to them and they can't shake it. Maybe it's a wrong decision that's kept you up all night and you're not resting and you're worrying and you're concerning yourself. Whatever, and I'm not going to try to go through the list because it's just inexhaustible. But whatever it is and wherever it was, there, I'm sure there are burdens in our lives that so great Sometimes we don't even want to talk about it. We just bottle it up and keep it within ourselves. There are times when your anxiety level is high, when your spirits are low, and even times when your outlook gets a little dim. You say, well, preacher, you know, I thought we're supposed to be positive people. We are. But we face realities of life that sometimes it takes our smile and pulls it downward. And we face these things. So I'm not going to give you pie in the sky. I'm not going to give you false hope. I'm not going to hype your flesh because that won't do any good. What I want to do is strengthen the spirit that was within you to realize where to lean on, who to lean on, and when to lean upon God, which it really should be all the time, and how to get past those places. So how do we explain all the suffering and the pain that is around us and then that we personally encounter? Now, we think, well, God's a good God, right? God's a loving God. Yep, he's all of that. So then why do these things happen to these people that seek to love God, serve God, and are faithful to God? First, let's establish a fact. None of us are truly good. <laughs> I'm sorry to bust your bubble there. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, you know, we seek to be good and we desire to be good, but sometimes we just flat not are good. So by God's standard, and that's what I'm basing this on, I'm basing it on the God's standard of his word, none of us are righteous. And the only righteousness that can come into our life is by the righteousness of Christ and receiving him. This morning, we're going to deal with the fact that, that redeemed people, the redeemed people of God, 
who have a real relationship with him battle over and over again trouble in this world in which we're living. It's, it's a horrible time for people. And this morning I've got three explanations concerning the difficulties that seemingly surround our lives so often. I do believe that God has a purpose for our suffering. And you know, a lot of times we get the mentality like Job's friend that God causes suffering in our life to punish us. And that's not always the case. There may be times as we're going to see that God has to get our attention through things because we have lost our focus. We've drifted away from God. We've become rebels against God. And we rebelled against his, his desires for our life. And sometimes God has to permit things to happen in our life to wake us up and to shake us up. But that's not always the case. Just because things happen in people's lives that's not so good does not mean that they have done something offensive in the presence of God. So it's more to it than we really feel or see. I think a lot of times our emotions and our feelings and sometimes our self-sympathy seeking can get a little bit overwhelming to us. But I'm going to show you several things here that maybe that we can get a better definitive idea, picture of what we're dealing with. One, suffering reveals the design of God. Um, it's because of the sinful world we're living in, because man sinned, because we've sinned, that we have suffering. That's why we have death. So God's fingerprints, though, if you will look very carefully, God's fingerprints are all over our suffering. He permits things to happen in our life. Thank God that he knows who we are and he knows that we are weak and frail, but we, he also knows the level of our faith that he can take that faith, increase it and strengthen us. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. And sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you, to comfort you concerning your faith. So there was a purpose and a plan in what Paul is writing here and what he's telling the people at the church of Thessalonians or the church of Thessalonica. He was concerned about their growth under such the harsh conditions that they were facing. They were going through great times of challenge and difficulty. So what Paul did, he sent the young man that he had been a mentor to. His name is Timothy. He sent Timothy to them with a purpose. And that purpose was to strengthen and to encourage the believers. I honestly believe that's one of the greatest things that we can do is to strengthen and to encourage one another. As a matter of fact, tonight in the evening message, I'm going to preach a message strictly on that fact of encouragement and how we need to encourage one another. God's design is over the trials that we face. I think sometimes we have the mentality, we think God checks out when the trials drop in. And that's not true. God is a refuge and strength and a very present, very present. I'm glad David put it that way, a very present help in time of trouble. So then we go to 1 Thessalonians 3, 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. He said, this is not the place that you fall down and fall out. He says, for yourselves know that we are appointed there unto. So Paul wanted the people to do something. He wanted them to know and to have full confidence that they basically were uh, de destined for this. It was going to happen as we all are destined for things in our lives. And we've got to learn to trust God and put our confidence in him. So Paul wanted the people to believe that there was a divine purpose for the suffering that they were encountering in their life. I don't know what you may be going through today. I may have some idea of some of you, but I don't have totally a concept of everything that everybody faces. And you don't know everything that I face. But the thing is that we ought to do is to lift up one another and to encourage one another. And know that God's in control. And with God being in control, there is going to be a better day, a brighter day, a bigger day someday. Yeah. So some churches are preaching a false message to people today. And basically giving them ideas and, and theology that does not match with God's word. They, they move... The move of this contemporary church that we see that is so prevalent today is if you love God and you walk with God, you will never have any problems in life. I don't know where they get that because there's nothing in the word of God that supports or substantiates that mentality. Uh, they argue the fact of these things that, you know, just do this and you'll get that. 
And this is a lot of this prosperity gospel that is being inundated into the hearts of people that's giving them a false hope. Uh, that argument fails flat on its face because uh, difficulty is a part of life. I mean, we don't like it, but we have to face it. And the, typically, the sooner you face it, the sooner you'll get through it. Amen. So the health and the wealth gospel today that is infiltrating our outweighs and the churches that's from the pulpits and from televisions and radios today really leave Christians wandering has God abandoned them and I talk to people every day and a lot of times people feel that way that they feel like God's abandoned them because he hasn't performed done things in the timing that they wanted it done and I'm telling you right now God's not the bellhop you don't ring a button or bell or push a bus buzzer and tell God when to jump. Remember, we're the servants of God and we are to serve him and we are to trust him. So you've got to get this right. God, get this, get this in your spirit. God has never turned his back on his people. Now, God may have permitted things, and there are examples after example in the pages of God's word where God has permitted. I mean, if you don't believe that, read 42 chapters in the book of Job. You'll find it there. And you read some of the other examples that are found in God's word. I mean, here's the apostle Paul. He was a persecutor of the church. He was a man who had great popularity, a man that had great wealth, a man that just basically ran the show, so to speak. And he had an encounter with God. Didn't have too many struggles before that. And he met the Lord and God changed his heart on the Damascus Road. And he changed not only his name, but he changed everything about him. And he became a child of God. But then Paul wrote most of what we know as the New Testament. But most of the New Testament that he wrote, he wrote it within the confines of a prison. And we think, well, wait a minute. Wasn't he doing better when he was not serving God? You never do better when you're not serving God. That's the worst thing that can happen in your life. Don't measure it today by people, other people, or things, or the world. The st all that is below. God's got something bigger, greater, and more encouraging for our hearts and our lives. So the Bible teaches today trials basically a part of a reality today in a fallen world. When actually today there's, there's a necessary reality today for the purpose of that we go through these issues to bring about the process that God has that is called sanctification. He wants to sanctify. To be sanctified means that God then wants to set us apart to be greater use for him. I love the way Jesus put it in John 16 and 33. These things I have spoken unto you that, you, that in me you might have peace. Now get the priority here right. He says first you're going to have peace. So you're going to go through struggles because he says in this world you shall have tribulations, which that word interpreted means struggles or troubles or challenges or difficulties, whatever you want to hang on that. But he says this, he put a conjunction in there and he says, but be of good cheer. How can you be of good cheer? Because he just told you in the first part of that verse that you've got peace in him. So if you've got peace in him, you can be, you can be of, a, of, of good courage or uh, uh, be cheerful in the fact that Jesus says, I, speaking of himself, have overcome the world. Yeah. Now, he said, when I've overcome the world, that means he's overcome everything in the world. He's overcome sin, he's overcome the shackles, he's overcome the suffering, he's overcome the sadness, he's overcome the situations, he's overcome everything from A to Z. So then you're in Christ, what does that make you? One, you got the peace of God because you've come to him and received him. Now God's put an inner peace within you today. Boy, I could preach this. I'm trying to teach it, but it's just really hard to just almost kick this little podium out and jump right in. But we've received this peace of God. This peace, he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 14, 27. So you got that peace. He said, yeah, you're going to have struggles, trials, and tribulations in this life. He says, but hey, just go ahead and be happy because I've overcome the world. And if I've overcome the world and my peace lives within you, then you too are more than a conqueror through me. Amen. Thank God. So when problems come, we need to really, you need to sit your, you really need to reset your default system. You need to default back to what God has placed within you. Instead of asking, why has God abandoned me, which people ask those questions, we should ask, 
What is God trying to teach me in the midst of the difficulties that I'm in? So what happens when we're saying, God, I just don't understand why this is happening to me. You know why you're saying that? Because you're all concerned about you. And I can appreciate that's, that's a natural tendency of our flesh is to say, why me? Why me? Why me? When we really should say, God, what do you want to do in me through what's happening? So God's trying to work something. You know, we spend more time sometimes in trials than we have to because we won't wake up to the reality. God's trying to increase our faith or teach us something or to improve our lives. Our lives. So suffering is a consequence of a fallen world. We've established that. Sickness is a result of, of basically Eden's fall. Death is a consequence of sin. Death has is, is basically come to all people. Pain and hardships and burdens and heartaches, we, we bear because this is a fallen world in which we live in. This is not a utopia. This is not a perfect world. But you know what's so amazing about this? In an imperfect world, God wants to be working his perfect work in you and I. That's amazing. So then it's inevitable in this world that we're going to face suffering. However, what we learn about God today is that in his goodness, he takes this inevitable suffering that we face that is basically a natural consequence because of the fallen world and because man fell and man has sinned. And then what he does, he designs our pain and our suffering so we don't experience it just in pain, but that we actually benefit from the pain that we're experiencing. In other words, God brings something good out of it. But you've got to get your spiritual focus right. Not fuzzy. You've got to get it focused on God and trust him that he knows what he's doing. So God's people sometimes suffer because, because God has to take harsh realities of the world and use them in our lives to draw our attention back to him. So we go to verse 4, 1 Thessalonians 3, and he says, For verily, uh, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. That word tribulation, don't get that confused with the, the seven-year tribulation. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about that word tribulation, interpreted meaning trouble. Even as it came to pass, and you know. So Paul warns the Thessalonians, he says that this is going to happen, it's a part of living, and he tells us the same thing today. So Paul told them, if you will follow Christ, you will suffer for your faith. We say, well, preacher, then uh, maybe I would be better not to serve God. Oh, you're far better to serve God. Amen. I promise you that. Paul told them, he said, follow Christ because he can take things and improve and increase your faith. So the presence of our problems doesn't disprove that the Bible is true. Actually, it really verifies that the Bible is true. The presence of difficulties in our lives prove or validates the validity of the Word of God. So the hope of Christianity is not that we avoid. We, our problem is, flesh problem is, we're trying to avoid the problems of life on earth but the hope really of Christianity today is that God has a purpose in every problem that we face. So we, the people of God, are like sheep among the wolves. But we've got to look to the chief shepherd, don't we? The good shepherd. It's the enduring, enduring through the hardships that we face, not the avoidance of hardships. Sure, and your flesh is going to try to avoid everything that it can. That doesn't mean you're going out looking for trouble, okay? Let me just throw that and insert that in there. You're not out looking for trouble and trying to play the role of a martyr. The fact is today, this, it's going to come to you anyway. You don't have to go looking for it. But realize that the, the evidence of hardships is the proof of your walk and your relationship with God. Yes, there's physical suffering. There's material hardships that we all face in life. There's often places that we're hated. Uh, and there's places that because of our relationship with the Lord, people don't like us. Well, the Bible says we are not to fear any of that. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. So Acts 14.22 says we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. So what do you mean? It means you enter into a closer walk relationship with him. So Paul said in Romans 8 that nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in, which is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need that promise that nothing, thank God, he went through a whole list of things, several, quite of things. You know, he just, one thing after another. That he brings to our attention. 
that none of these things can separate us from the love of God because in this world you will face some tough and hard places and all these things that Paul tells us about in Romans 8. He says, none of these can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So that means what? You're anchored on the rock. And the rock is covering you. The rock is Jesus. So don't miss this. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. 2 Timothy 3 and 12 says, Yea, or yes, and all that we live, un- live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's part of life, folks, as a Christian. So suffering is a common reality of the Christian experience. So the, the presence of trials is intended to build your faith to strengthen you and not to destroy you. God doesn't destroy you. God develops you. He increases your faith. You're going to need a greater measure of faith down the road for something else that you're going to face. So what are some of the purposes that God has when we suffer? Well, let me see if I can reel them off to you here quickly. God uses suffering to grow and to strengthen our faith. So our faith is increased by this. You know, you can't stay the same. You're either going forward and improving for God or you're regressing or drifting. God does not want you drifting. God wants you delivered and stay delivered. So it's important that suffering can grow your faith in the Lord. James 1, 2, and 3, he says, my brethren, count it all joy. (laughs) I haven't seen too many Christians do that. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or when you fall into the struggles of life. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Well, in essence, what he's saying here, the trying of your faith will work and show you the reality of the grace of God. That his grace never fails us. Didn't God tell the same guy that wrote what we're reading today that my grace is sufficient for you? Amen. Amen. Sometimes suffering is for our growth. God cares about our character. He cares more about our character than he does our comfort. We care about our comfort because we want just a nice, snugly, warm, sunshiny life that never has any problems. We want the yellow brick road mentality. But I'm going to tell you, there's some mud pits and some, some gravel roads along life that you're going to have to course down. Amen. So God's mission is, is devoted More to our holiness than so much to our happiness. Here's another point for you. I think he's in your study guide. God uses suffering to reveal our weakness and to demonstrate his strength. So it's one thing to believe God is enough. It's another thing to know God's enough. I don't believe it. I know it. How do you know it? I know it through the experiences of life. That's how I know it. 2 Corinthians 12 and 10 says, Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I what? Strong. Isn't that amazing? I mean, God just gives you a paradox here of what you think pulls you down. God says, I used to pull you up. Amen. So the lower you go, the more Christ is exalted in your life. Amen. Here's another bullet for you. God uses, maybe bullets aren't a good term to use. Here's another point. God uses, here's another arrow pointing upward. God uses suffering to, you know what bullets do. God uses suffering to increase our effectiveness in ministry. So do you know that God never uses anything until he first breaks it? He sometimes has to break us that he can use us. It seems the most effective people are those today that have faced the greatest hardships and struggles in life. 1 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5 says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. That's good. Who comforted us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the suffering of Christ abound in us, so our consolation is also bound by Christ. So when when we're going through the struggles of life, you know, we want someone who has basically walked through that valley, experienced that same thing to comfort us because they have walked the path that you're walking. So you can be confident that God... see. Yeah, God is your helper, but you know what you need to also learn through this? God uses other people to bless you and to help you and to comfort you. 
Amen. And we need to try to be that to other people. You can be comforted that God's using suffering and he does it for his glory. He does it for your good. And you know what? It's amazing how God can work through those things and bring a blessing to you. We don't, we don't have to feel good about our suffering. I'm not sitting up here today and saying, oh, just go on and jump up in the pew and praise God and raise your hands and say, I am so glad I'm going through so much stuff. I'm not asking you to do that. You can feel good how God uses your suffering to bless others. And that you'll get a blessing out of it. Here's another point, an arrow. God uses suffering as a means to spread his gospel. So the most powerful opportunities to witness for Christ occur when our life seems to be somewhat at some place in time falling apart. So people who, people will listen if you speak the gospel, but people will respond when you live the gospel. That's a different thing, isn't it? I see people on Facebook, I'm not on it much, and I purposely don't go on it much because I really don't want to read all the riffraff and the stupid stuff that people put on there. Amen. I'm just being blunt here because people so, put so much stuff on there that just basically gives God two black eyes. And it diminishes their faith. And really, honestly, it just is a big mirror. Facebook is a big mirror to show what your heart is and where your life is at. So people... They, they don't want to hear what you're going to say. They want to see how you're living it. Here's another point. God uses suffering to challenge other believers for Christ. So, and here's another one. God uses suffering as a form of discipline. Hebrews 12, 9 and 10. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which cor corrected us and we gave them reverence. That means respect. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father's spirits and live? For they verily uh, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. So God uses things to bring us back to where we need to be. We drift from God. Let's face it. There's been places and times we've probably all done that, right? Sure, preacher. I'll answer it for you. We drift from God until we face the hand of God's discipline. And God disciplines you because he loves you. And sometimes that's a big pill to swallow. But man, listen, heed what God's trying to tell you and get back and get right with him. Pain in God's, pain is, uh, I think it was C.S. Lewis that said this. Pain is God's megaphone calling out to rebellious hearts. And it really is, and it can be used in that. If you're not careful, we can become spiritual rebels, but God breaks our resistance. You know what he does it with? Why does God then do this? Because he loves you. God uses pain and suffering not to hurt us, but to make us more like himself. So suffering reflects the design of God in our lives. Let me give you, here's another one, another point, second point. Suffering reveals dedication to God. Verse 5, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent you uh, I sent to you to know your faith, let by some means the, t the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. So Paul was so concerned for the believers who were suffering and what they were going through. He wanted to know if their faith was real. He wanted to know if they really meant business for God. Paul knew that Satan was always ready to cast a cloud of doubt and confusion and difficulty and God's goodness Realizing that he'll do everything to try to discourage us. As a point of advice here, be careful about making major decisions when you're hurting. Be careful what you say when you're hurting. Amen. Paul knew the strategy of Satan. And it's Satan's strategy, strategy, strategy to destroy you. The failure to correct, re, correctly respond to suffering and trials and the things that you face indicate a lack of dedication to God. So you tell on yourself. God is not there to just make life easy for you. He didn't just save you to say, oh boy, now you can go to heaven. That's all there is? No, there's a whole lot of Jesus along life's path. We've got to trust him even when life is hard and bad. So the brevity of life is not, not a reason to rebel against God. The brevity, brevity of life gives us power to endure through the sufferings that we face. So remember, your reward 
will outweigh your suffering. Let me say that again. Your reward will outweigh your suffering. Let me say that again. Your reward will outweigh your suffering. So Romans 8 and 18 says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Hey man, something better, far better, much greater is coming. So suffering reveals basically a, a, a dedicated or a either a dedicated or rebellious heart. It's going to show one or the other. So when we trust God and we walk with God and we believe the promises of God that are brought to us by his word, we look at ourselves as a basically as a shadow, but we all have eternity to celebrate in our faithfulness to him. Verse 6. But now when Timothy came from my own to you, came from me unto you and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, charity is love, that ye have good remembrance of us always, designed greatly to see us, as we also, also to see you. Verse 7. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all of our affliction and distresses for your, our faith, or your faith. So Paul is relieved to hear the, of their faith and their love that they have for God. So their faith referred to their steadfast commitment to God. And you've got to have that. Their love demonstrated that they believed that they, what they had been basically taught by God. So Paul then basically comes to a conclusion and says in verse 6, eight, verse, verse 8 rather. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. So that's, that's a key. The storms of life reveal, let me just shake all that down for you. The storms of life basically reveal our commitment to the Lord. And the last point is this, and let me make it quick, and it's a short one. Sufferings require dependence on God. As hard as life gets sometimes, and can be, it's also a time that you can grow in your dependence upon the Lord. This old song goes back, I lean on you, Lord. I lean on you. I forgot who sung it. But that leaning is a dependence, isn't it? When the, when the winds of life are blowing their hardest, your dependence on God is sometimes all you have. But I'm going to tell you what that dependence on God does. Are you listening? It never fails you. Amen. So what... For what thanks can we render to God, verse 9, 10, again to you for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So Paul prayed two things for the people. Here they are. One, that he would see them again, which he had that promise. Two, to encourage them to keep walking with God. I'm standing before you today to encourage you. You're going to face struggles. You're going to face trials. You're going to have bad days. But don't stop walking with God. As a matter of fact, jump up in his arms. Because you know what happens? It's him that's carrying you anyway. Amen. So sustained suffering requires sustained dependence upon God. Suffering gives us the opportunity just to nudge up closer to the Lord. So if we're not close to the Lord... You're going to fall prey to the strikes and the attacks of Satan. Remember, if you're suffering, just keep on depending on God. Amen. And even, in, and even to the point, go on and praise God even in the suffering that you were going through. Paul and Silas did it in the Philippian jail. And at midnight, they began singing praises and praying to God. God got happy. He shook the, shook the jail. Souls were saved. God brought a great deliverance. They praised God in the infirmity. They were shackled. They were in the inner prison. They had been beaten. They were a mess. But you know what they did? They lifted up their voice and said this kind of like, kind of like what Stephen said. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Amen. Amen. So you can remember in your suffering today, you can depend upon the Lord. My last thought for you is this. Your trials may knock you down, which they do sometimes. Just don't let them keep you down. Remember, God will get you back on your feet Amen. every time. Thank you, Father, for the time that we've had to share the word this morning. It's been a good study. Thank you for the great Apostle Paul and the inspiration that you gave him to pen these things down for our admonition and encouragement and strength. 
I pray now that, Lord, you will bless this church, its people, and it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. May your name be elevated. May you be exalted. May you be praised here today. May hearts come to Christ, and may hearts be blessed is my prayer. And all the praise we give to you in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, what? Praise the Lord.